Hey, what's up? Silas here. So I'm here in Nairobi, Kenya, and some of you may have heard of this already, but there was a recent terror attack on January 15th of 2019. Still kind of, eh, I guess it's my first time actually saying the date out loud and got the 2019 right. So start of the year, starting off in a kind of bad way. Um, I want to do these kind of videos now on my channel and do these things where certain topics and certain things I wait 24 to 48 hours after it happens before I actually come out to talk about it. Because so much really goes on in these kind of events where you're hearing all this information about things and you don't know if it's actually accurate. You know, people are kind of coming out and speculating about things, they want to know what's going on, all these rumors go around. And I think this is a common thing. And um, I want to kind of just have this video and talk to you guys about it. Definitely a lot of thanks to uh, the people who checked in with me. I've got friends in different places, different countries and different continents. A lot of people were checking in and that was, that was really, it was really nice. And I was sort of wondering, you know, you get to these kind of situations and you're like, okay, um, do you actually talk to people? You know, some people I haven't talked to in a while. It's, it's odd to kind of go out and just reach out to somebody when this happens. But hey, I mean, that's what these kind of things were. And it kind of made me kind of think of this thing on the side too. A lot of people seem to bring up these microaggressions, these issues where you're like, is that really an issue? These first world problems type of thing. And I wonder, okay, there's actual issues out there. There's actual people going through a lot of other things. But I think a lot of situations people are lonely and they understand that when something bad happens, when someone's in danger, it's human nature to reach out. So yeah, it's a horrible situation that's happened. I think we can all agree on that. But I think that nature that we have to come out together and just reach out and be concerned with somebody and see, is this person okay? I've heard about this. And and that's there. I think that kind of surplants or it's it's a bigger part of humanity than the horror and the terror is. In my opinion, I think you guys can actually go out there and evidence that by yourself, by your own lived experiences with these kind of things. So with this video, I'm kind of going to just walk you guys through my experience of getting to find out what was happening and just the next couple of days talking about a few things. I screen capped some things and I'm going to kind of have them on the screen here and go through them and kind of just step by step and talk about different things. People ask me certain questions. If anything comes to mind, I'll kind of just talk about it as we go through these things. Um, there's definitely a lot of information online. There's local newspapers, local news stations, international people have covered this. This is a big thing. It's a, it's a, it's a global world now. The whole globalization is here. Even at the same point, you know, like it gets to this point where, as I said, I've, I know people in different places. And it gets to the point where now, you know people who know people who know someone. You're pretty much connected. The whole six degrees of bacon thing. Uh, you're pretty much connected to someone all over the world. And to get these kind of situations, so just immediately, of course, the first thing I'm like, okay, let me check with the people who I know. Is anyone there? I start looking around and... Um, Actually, let me just go through step by step and uh, we'll actually get into that as we go through the whole process. So right now I'm going to put up on the screen um, just some of the screen caps that I have. This is Kenyan flag, for those of you who don't know. Um, it's a little crust there. Um, <laughs> actually, it's the information. I went to some, uh, I went to like, not middle school, elementary school. Most of my elementary schools here in Kenya we sang the national anthem. And with Kenya, it's a rather young country. It's about 60 years old. And... Um, the nationalism is still coming up and situations like this do bring that nationalist thing in there but there's still a lot of tribalism and there's still a lot of um other divisions that i think have been left in uh the first world countries you know i mean people with the clans and things like that it's not too big of a thing even though like a name like mcgregor used to be like clan mcgregor versus clan mcleod or whatever and then they would know each other and the whole idea of becoming ireland was something that came a lot later is it ireland or scotland I don't yeah. <laughs> I come came later, uh, after the whole idea had kind of fallen off to the side. Okay, so let's get into this. So the Kenyan flag. So when I got this information, I just went out for. I was taking a walk. I was just walking around, and um, yeah. my sister tweets me, and she's in Italy right now in Rome, and she tweets me like, "Hey, what's going on in Riverside?" And I said, "I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just taking a walk." And this is the thing. She was in a WhatsApp group. She was living in Kenya for a while, but now she's living in Rome. Um, she was in a WhatsApp group with some friends who were here in Kenya, and they were actually living, I mean, working in the Riverside area, and they were hearing some things. I'm like, okay, I don't know. This is right as it was starting to happen. So um, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Uh, I start checking online, check on Twitter, nothing's coming up yet. And um, so I'm just taking this walk in this area, and that's the way the world is connected. I found out about this 
by hearing it from my sister who was in Rome talking to people who were about uh, four and a half kilometers away from me. That's about uh, two and a half miles. It's about two miles away. Like, yeah, it's like two miles and like two and a third miles or something away from where I was taking the walk. So I wasn't in any direct danger. I had no plan of going there. But I just started hearing that information. And then um, this is a picture they were sent. They sent me. Um, this is a picture that my sister sent me. So this is people who just started to take pictures. And this is the thing. I remember some time back there was a tsunami that happened in Japan. The one that, in, that initiated the Fukushima nuclear plant kind of uh, breakdown, uh, meltdown the meltdown of sorts but anyway so i was thinking wow there's going to be so many cameras of this tsunami because people in japan are very technologically advanced i mean they've had previous ones like in indonesia but the parts in indonesia it was like some people on the coast maybe some tourists were like getting out their phones but having this in japan everyone has has, has uh phones i mean that's what you think about the place people have phones people could actually document this thing and that already happens here in kenya people have phones so this was in a rather um Upper class neighborhood, uh, Westlands, like Riverside area. It's close to where I was, and it's a it's a very it's commercial residential. The school I went to is actually right behind the office park. This happened. This happened in Dusit Hotel, and there was an office park there. So it's kind of like you have this main gate. Uh, walls are still a big thing here in Kenya, as you can see in this picture here. They th this is just like a regular house. You see, even across the street, um, there's going to be a wall there. And then on um, this other side, closer to the screen here, you can see the people down here. So um, that's how they have walled kind of places. But then you go in the street and then you enter this place where the Dusit Hotel was. And then there's a, other offices, kind of an office park, a complex kind of thing. So there's different people in there. But Dusit Hotel was the main thing. So news starts coming in. You start hearing this already people kind of editing the photo. One armed suspect hiding with others. So right here, it's going to be pertinent to kind of discuss this guy right here. This, he looks like he's dressed in military fatigues, but what happens, you can't have armed security, um, private security firms here. They have like G4S, which is like a British company. They have one called Pinkerton. They have this other one, like orange colors. There's a few major security forces that you normally see them kind of taking bank cars around, like transferring money between the bank banks and the central banks, doing kind of things like that. Security, securing other areas. You can have them to secure your house. Uh, K4 or something is another one. But they have these kind of situations. But I think with the laws and the rules and regulations here in Kenya, they have to hire police officers when they're not on duty or... Uh, army officers, so they hire them in that kind of situations. I don't know, I don't think the pay is that high, but it's a steady job in general, but that's kind of how the situation is. So you have a lot of semi-private security in that kind of sense for the more upper class people, like a, a hotel or a bank, or an office building, will normally kind of get these um, extra people, these out exterior security, and not just rely directly on the police services to do this. Neither will it be completely private security firms. You can't, like, I can't just decide I'm just going to open a private security firm, arm my people with guns. But normally, these guys are walking around with actual, like, AK-47s, um, actual weapons, actual um, semi-automatic weapons. Some, some of them have some rifles, and they're the ones who are actually walking around, and they normally kind of secure the situation. So this guy who looks like in the middle of the street, looks like he's holding a gun. I don't really know. I haven't really followed what happened with this picture, but that was just some of the things. Now here on Twitter, Twitter is very active here in Nairobi and Kenya. There's a big Twitterverse. I think you guys can check in on it and uh, we'll see some trending things later. But this is one of the things I kind of just picked up on when I first got online and I saw this guy's story. Um, and I, I checked up on him. I get back to him right like Robert Ngeno. And um, he's like, I'm in 14 Riverside Drive, hiding in a bathroom and we are under attack. And he's just tweeting this up. And then people kind of get in. He's saying, okay, there was a massive bomb uh, blast and gunshots. Please, you at U.S. Embassy Kenya, at Israel Embassy, help SOS. So now he's atting these people. And now these are the U.S. Embassy in Kenya, the Israeli Embassy, of course. Uh, they have their own Twitter page. So he's just kind of getting information out. <clears throat> and this is one thing that I'd seen that I think you see in a lot of places in the world, where before the major media stations were even picking up the news, of this thing, there was already a lot of information on Twitter. And now with the major news things, they have to double check things, they have, to, um, they have that level, they have that standard of, okay, we need to understand that this is actually happening, we have to double check, is this really a situation? They have that level where they actually want to have some credibility. I know there's a lot of fake news and things like that going out, but they want to have some credibility so they double check and make sure. But anyway, um, Kenyans, uh, it's a lot of very religious people here in general. I 
as you may know if you're watching this channel, I'm a religious and I see some of these things and you can see with the reaction here, he says, if I die, um, I love the Lord and I believe I will go to heaven. Please tell my family I love you. I love them. Um, I love you, Caleb, Mark and Carol. It's really heartfelt and this really just, wow. I mean, you're sending this uh, thing out. You don't know what's going to happen in this situation. Uh, people are responding. You're not dying today. Pole, uh, that's, I'm um, sorry. Um, hold on. Don't panic. God is watching over you. And this kind of God is watching over you thing, I kind of ask like, God, I mean, as we want to find out, it, it was terrorists. It's been found out this were Al-Shabaab, these were militants and things like that. And they also think their God is watching them to do this. I was talking to somebody um, about this and we're like, okay, how do you even do this? How do you even get to this situation? And, um, you know, CCTV, uh, closed circuit TV with like banks and other things out there. I'll just let you know kind of what I've sur surmised happened. They put a bomb in a restaurant. The bomb went off. Then they walked in with machine guns. It was five of them dressed in black fatigues. They had vests on with ammo clips and things. These guys were prepared. They were ready for it. I'm going to go into like some possible reasons why they did it. But then definitely there is that aspect where it's like, what would it take for me or you to actually just be pissed off enough at some other being, some other group of people to decide I'm going to indiscriminately go and kill these other group of people in order to get my grievance out. I think it takes a lot for somebody to do that. Even when it comes to the military where we consider the good guys, the military and outside, they understand there's a part where you have to break somebody down in boot camp. They understood, I think, in the First World War, they had maybe 30% of the people actually shot their weapons. Even when they were in trenches and people were 100 yards away from bullets flying, they wouldn't shoot their weapons because like, these are other human beings. And that whole thing, people understand, for you to get to the point where you're just going to indiscriminately shoot another person, is very slim to it very few people can do that it takes a lot of reasons and men, just issues it's mental illness it's all kinds of things but there is an aspect of it where i know here he's saying god is watching over you and that gives people solace in some situations but that whole faith that a god is watching you is also something that helps drive the people who are doing these kind of things they think i am doing this as a combatant for my god so it just, it just bothers me when I see this on both sides, and I do understand it's there, but yeah, that's just something I kind of want to discuss. So no, please don't give up, stay sharp, get safe. Um, so I thought that was just something to see there. And um says, Moya, praying for you, man, not safe, try climbing to the ceiling. You're with Shafi Abule, uh, Shafi Abule. Climbing to the ceiling, I, I think this is might be too much of the media and things like that. Most ceilings you can't necessarily actually get in. It's not like movie theaters where you can walk through the air conditioning. Air conditioning things are only kind of tight. Uh, if you actually get into a ceiling that has like that, it might be like a, a more solid ceiling. They might have some um, lattice work or some metal work where you're going to fall through. The whole idea that you can just climb in and be supported up there. No, that's that's not how most ceilings work. Um, that's just an odd thing. So I should be well, hide your location. And as I mentioned, just spoiler not spoiler you should know this. the guy got out and uh, there's an article about him later on that i'm going to get into this kind of um show you guys that yeah he got out and the uh, media actually went and found him and things like that i think even as he was tweeting there someone's like hey that's later on in that actual thread we're like oh i kept checking it. like oh, i saw somebody who looked like you being pulled up and that's the crazy thing right now the way information comes out so people are watching videos on there now the the media is actually getting into the place and now they're sending out film people are tweeting with them in there I'm talking to people, I'm, by this time I've checked and pretty much all the people that I know are safe or somebody's like, yeah, I had some friends who actually work in that area, but one of them is in out of the country on a posting doing some work out there. The other one didn't decide to show up today. So that was one of the closest that I thought, okay, somebody I know, that was one, two people, two people away from me was like, okay, it was my, uh, my cousin or my niece. She knew somebody that could have been there. So that was it. That's, that's what I thought. Okay, that was it. And uh, later on, um, my mom tells me that um, she's talking to some people and she's like, okay, they need some advice. They're hiding in a building. I'm like, are they in the actual building that's being attacked? We don't really know information at this time. I'm like, no, they're hanging out. And it's like, he said there was like 25 or something people. And I was like, okay, uh, from what I had, and it's just the, the times that we live in, you have to be prepared. You have to know, this is information that you know if you live in public and things like this. And um, previously when I was here in Nairobi, Kenya, the largest... I think attack that you guys may have heard of was a Westgate one, which happened, um, I want to say like about eight years now, eight years ago now, may, might have been less than that. Excuse, I should remember the date, but the Westgate attack was at a mall, and I had been at that mall 
three times in the week before three times and i was actually thinking of going there the neighbor who was living in the compound that i was living in they had just left 20 minutes ago and a friend of theirs was actually in that mall got shot in the leg so i've had some some near misses with these things there was an attack in new york that occurred when i was visiting when i was i'd been living in new york at the time and i came back to kenya then over the month or so that i was here i heard there was like a bombing on like 27th street and 7th avenue or something like that um the 27th Avenue, I'm forgetting the way the grid system is set up in New York already. But anyway, I, it was a street that I walked down occasionally to go to a supermarket there and there was a sideway bomb, there was a bomb there and I'm like, okay, I could have been involved in that. And thinking about all these things. So it's just in general, I think people who live in suburban developed areas kind of have some certain awareness of what happened during a terrorist attack because now these are things that do happen. It's just something to, to know. So I, from what I had gleaned from it, I was thinking, okay, this is what you're going to do. I was telling my mom, just tell them to barricade the door, turn off the lights. We're asking, should we turn off the lights? Yeah, barricade the door, turn off the lights, get away from the door, stay low, uh, turn your phones on silent. Uh, you can still have them on to get information out and things like that. So well and good. So I'm getting updates about this. They end up sending a list of the people who are actually in there hiding. And then it turns out that actually one of a relative was in there. Like a, the way they go here, it would be considered like a niece of mine but it's like my mom's sister's uh grandson so it's like but the guy's like on my age anyway he was hiding in there and just small world in a bad way this way but just finding out that people are out there just checking in and just a mess of a situation uh, the guy got out um it was definitely a lot later because it takes a lot of time to clear that whole area um but yeah Okay, so this is one of the first pictures of the area that I'd seen. I heard there was a bomb in a restaurant. That was the first thing that we heard. And then from there, um, you can see the message here, 14 Riverside is under attack. Bomb has just exploded. Secret garden restaurant gone with everyone in it. So there's some gruesome pictures online. Um, it's been reported that all five of the terrorists were shot dead and there's pictures of them with bullet wounds one guy's head out i'm not going to post any of these pictures if you want to go online you could probably i was like wow these are they're up on twitter they haven't been flagged down it's a lot of pictures are being posted up it's kind of hard for the people to just flag those things down automatically there's no like flag bot like oh you've tagged you've said this word that's not pc or whatever so in an event like this i think they also if there's anyone on twitter i think they would also want to err on the side of letting things go in case any of that information would actually help somebody. But then there's this flip side where people are wondering like, hey, if you're posting things of where you are hiding too much details, are the people actually looking online? But I'm also thinking like, this is another thing. How do you get into the mindset of these people? Are they sitting there thinking like, okay, let me go on Twitter and, f and check and see where people are hiding and then like follow them. If there's somebody else who's at off-site being on Twitter, like checking what people are saying, then sending, relaying information to the shooters that are there. So people are kind of wondering, like, don't put out too much information because you can give your location, but I don't think these people are actually at the same time actually on there. It can make maybe some movie or some kind of plot in some book or something where you're like, yeah, actually, the people actually end up going on Twitter or some social media and using that to actually track the people. But let me not talk about these things and give people ideas. But anyway, um. So I was seeing this picture, and as I said, I was taking a walk. And these kind of things where it takes some time for you to actually absorb them. Like, is this actually happening? I saw this picture a few times. You can see here where the grass, this is all I'm going to show. But there's a larger picture of this, and there was like some kind of thing just right here on the path where the picture cuts off. There was some extra thing there, and I thought it could have just been some detritus blown out from the, you can see the scorch marks and things. It looks like scorch marks. So I was thinking just some detritus blown out from the hotel, uh, from the restaurant. And... After going through and seeing it maybe the sixth or seventh time, I was like, what is that? You can see some floors up. It's a bit blurry. It was a human leg that had been severed from the person. And it's still tough to actually just... These are the kind of things where it's hard to imagine. And it's kind of like you don't even want to imagine just being in a situation like that. Um, okay, so here you can see um, 14 Riverside bomb followed by shooting. Keep off this area. Stay safe. Run, hide, fight. Um, this is Mathri Root. I don't know what Mathri Root, but this is a company here in Kenya. I'm assuming, if I think it is what it is, I was just thinking there was this system in Kenya, the, the buses are in this kind of haphazard way, but I was thinking it'd be a cool system to just have people with phones where you can actually just do kind of like an Uber ride sharing thing where you're at the actual bus station and if this bus has your kind of service, you can just be like, okay, I'm waiting at the bus station because there's a problem that I see here in Kenya. The buses are paid, the people are paid 
by commission on how many people are on the bus. So the buses normally stay at the end of the station until it's completely full. So sometimes we'll go to the end of the station to fill it with 14 people or 35 people or however many people, they'll wait at the station for 30 minutes. But if they have this app where they can tag and then people can be like, okay, on the way they know they'll pick up 20 people and it's a 14 seater, they'll leave and pick up those 20 people instead of waiting at the station for only 14 people and depending on this time. Just I don't know if this is just rooting it out because Matri is Matatu is the name of the buses, the 14 seater buses and the big ones that actually go. So I might check this out and see what this, uh, this app is about. But this is one thing I kind of also wanted to use this video to tell you guys about Kenya a bit more. Um, a lot of positive things come in Kenya, the big tech industry, a lot of apps and things like that. The youth, although the government uses youth in a way where people like in their 50s and like, oh, where are the youth? Because they still have the mzees and wazees, they still have that whole, uh, old tribal thing where you respect your elders and you still have elder statesmen like really out there calling that whole thing. Uh, they still have the tribal elders and things like that. When a president is running or when a politician is running, they go to different major tribes and they sit with the tribal elders and they get like the nod from the tribal elders and a big contingent from that tribe will actually vote for that person. So that's still a big part of uh, Kenyan um, society. But anyway, you have one in Africa that's in general is a lot of very young people. I think uh, over 50% of the population is under 30 years old. There's a population boom in that sense. But I think it's just a population boom that comes after industrialization is actually affected. When you look at the people in the cities, they're having a lot fewer children than the people in the countryside. And that's what happens. I think eventually you level out where I think the resources for humans to actually live in in Kenya in Africa were so underused that now with industrialization, it's supporting a higher number of people. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to boom. This uptick in population is going to continue. It's going to level out at a point. So this whole idea, oh, I'm a overpopulation, I think that's an overblown thing. Um, so here, um, this is just showing, okay, Samuel Mulinga. Again, I was just taking some different screenshots of different things. Um, we're being attacked at 14 Riverside Drive, gunshots and explosions. So this is how the information was coming out, and it's just showing you how this gets out around in the people. I mean, in the general public. Now, this was some of the early pictures. Some of the vehicles, I don't know if this is what the cars that were used. I think the bomb was actually in the restaurant there. They set these cars on fire somehow. And this is one of the reasons that I'm thinking might have happened. Currently, I had mentioned that Westgate attack, and the court case is going on for it. One of the suspects was set was found not innocent but there's a few other suspects who are actually in that thing that court case is going on so i was thinking this could be related to it another thing here is like the battle of el ade um took place on 15th january 2016 marks the third anniversary and possibilities of terror related activity in riverside district hotel is likely so i think this is one of the other possibilities this case is still a few days after so it's still unfolding. A lot of information is going to come out for this. Al-Shabaab has already declared that, yes, this was an operation of theirs. But um, there was other information. Someone was like, okay, there was a, a U.S. conference somewhere else and the people might have gotten the wrong hotel. I'm like, no, no, that's not going to happen. I think they would know exactly what hotel these people are planned out. These people know what they're doing. Um, but um, unfortunately, talking about the U.S. targeting, uh, right now, it was 15 people dead. Uh, 11 of them were Kenyan citizens. One of them was a British citizen, United Kingdom. Two of them did have identification by the time I had checked. And one of them was an American, I think a 40-year-old. Apparently, he had actually survived somehow the 9-11 attacks in New York. Um, and somehow, he found his way here and ended up getting killed in this attack. So that's a horrible, horrible situation. But I think... There's also this thing, you know, people might think, oh, it's God, it's all of this. But I'm like, okay, the simple thing, the same place that makes a certain location a target for evil people with evil intentions is going to be the same kind of thing that's going to, going to attract a certain type of people for positive intentions and for good things. So this guy was involved in things, his mentality drove him to the same thing. And that's the thing, different things happen for the same reasons. Different people will come to these places for the same reasons. And the same people, the same places will be visited by different people. So this is kind of something that just happens. And unfortunate situation that happened with him. And of course, you can look online and find more information on these things. Now, in Kenya, um, of course, when it first happens, that's why I was saying I like waiting 24, 48 hours before I start thinking. Quick arrests start happening. This is a gentleman uh, who was arrested here. You can see here this man who's been arrested as a suspect in the 14 Riverside attack was identified as lawyer member Muriki. Murioki, sorry, uh, who is a licensed arm dealer. People are wondering, is he involved with this? Is it an arms deal? Is he the one who sold them guns or whatnot? But there's very few people in Kenya actually own guns. It's rather expensive to actually get. It's like 
and uh, hundreds of thousands of shillings, which is a few thousand dollars. If it's sh with shillings, it's like a hundred shillings, it's about a dollar. So you just kind of move the decimal point to over to kind of understand the amounts. But it's 350,000 to 500,000 to actually go through the process of getting a gun license. And then when you actually need to buy the guns, again, a in the 50,000 range, in the hundreds of thousands range for just a simple pistol. So it's very few people actually have guns here in Kenya, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. This guy was actually, he runs a gun range, he does gun training. He was arrested here, he was let go. Um, but yeah, quick arrests start happening. And this is a general thing that happens. I think um, it's a typical thing that happens in a lot of places. Uh, right here, this is another guy, uh, Riverside Attack. I'm curious of the identity of this fellow. He was extremely helpful to the survivors of the attack and went in severally to rescue more people. Was once was one of the first at the scene, went in without a bulletproof uh, jacket, true self-sacrifice and the other. Now this guy, he was also involved in the Westgate attack. If you look online, you can find information about him. You can see here people are responding. Um, there was an odd response i should have gotten some of the images from uh the uh, lawyer guy that was getting as one of the things was his name lawyer or is he a lawyer he's actually a lawyer the guy who was actually taken down but uh, i don't know so um they're looking at some information here uh you can see he was at westgate the reaction to this guy i guess because he was at westgate before was like okay you see was at westgate he's kenyans and runs a shooting range just like the lawyer guy so he does training he's trained police and things like that he's been involved some, again, this is some rumors, I haven't confirmed this, or saying he's involved with the police before, kind of a special SWAT type of unit, this unit called the Flying Squad, which are known for like driving around in these little fast undercover cars and maybe they're armed and things like that. And they, they deal with like gangs and things like that and some higher um, danger kind of uh, cases and things like that. So that's a Flying Squad. I think he was involved in that. I think he's retired now, but he lives in this general area. I think the same thing when the Westgate thing happened, he heard about that and moved to that location and checked in. Um, same thing with this. I think he came in. He might have come in with the police officers or not, but he came in and he did go in repeatedly to kind of get people out of the place. Um, he's a foreigner, but you have these kind of people move in and then they, like, they fall in love with the country and then they decide to stay and make a home for themselves and they become as Kenyan as anyone else. And um, they get the support from the locals here. You see, but Steve Bogo ni model. Uh, so, um, right here, that's some Swahili. Uh, with Stephen Bogo, we'll get to that later uh, at, towards the end here. But I saw him on TV reassuring a certain shaken lady she was not dying today. What a brave fella. Um, must be an unknown special agent, perhaps rescued uh, victims after inflicted damage inflicted, um, after inflicted damage to terrorists. He had his weapon with him. Looks like a hero. Uh, yeah, I've seen him severally too. So, there's lots of discussion about this guy and pictures about him going around. You can probably find some more information about him online. Um, as we were talking about, okay, what do you what do you do? How do you cover this? How do you discuss this? This guy was being interviewed and he did a really good thing. You know, he was like, yeah, I'm in this interview. And you can see here, that's how it should be done. Don't disclose any information to the outside world. The attackers have people going through the live feed and they're in constant communication with the attackers. Kudos to that interview. So this guy, he was being interviewed and he was like, yeah, I'm, I was hiding in there, but I've gotten out. He's like, I can't give you details. There's still people hiding in there. And that's a, that's a key thing. I mean, sometimes people go in like, yeah, there's 50 people in this place, in this place. They could be checking. I don't know. They could be checking. I think it's better to err on the side of caution. Again, with a quick arrest. This guy, I saw footage of Bryson Mambui in the back of the police car after he was arrested. Uh, we know that he's in police custody. His friends and family say he was rescuing people at NPS official. Now that's getting at the National Police uh, Service, of, uh, official National Police Service Twitter of Kenya. Uh, we hope it was safe. So this, again, some of the false arrests happen. This guy is younger looking. He could have looked, matched some identification of the people in there. And this is kind of a thing that happens. Uh, the guy got out. So we're talking about the Steve Bogo. So right here, you can check online the Steve Bogo challenge. This guy is, I'm, I'm not going to say he's a celebrity politician or something, but anyway, he heard apparently this is what some of the rumors that i saw had some of his friends in that office park area so he is one of the kenyans that has his own weapons has his own bulletproof vest so he came here with his with his friend here and they got that thing and it's a steve bogo challenge going on on twitter right now you can see people kind of too soon type of thing and uh you know those twitter challenges things like i heard they have the bird the bird bird flow bird it's with a blindfold. What's that movie with Sandra Bullock with her face all like, oh, it's so sad what they do with these. What What's with them? They all get their face in the same way. And maybe it's just a thing, it's a higher challenge for females to have this and that sucks. But whatever's happening in culture to get females to think they need to do this to their face, I, I wish that would stop because her face looks 
Weird. But anyway, um, Bird Box? Bird Box. That's what it's called. Uh, the Bird Box Challenge, where people are now putting on the 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 blindfolds and doing things. Anyway, so Stephen Bogo Challenge was just different people dressing up in a similar way like this and standing like these two chaps are standing here. And it's kind of funny just how to show how Kenyans kind of can just make light of this different communities here in Kenya. Uh, if you guys want to check that out, Stephen Bogo Challenge, check it out on Twitter, probably on Instagram. You can find some interesting pictures on there. So this is kind of showing where they're out there. You can see some military people are actually there with their weapons and they're allowed. If you have the license, they're not going to bother you. And I think it's kind of another thing where it's a different kind of reaction where the talk online is not, oh, we need to have gun control. We need to have this because guns aren't really that common here in Kenya. Although they were talking about here, you see they're talking about Kenya is a broken down country. Some people just jump into that. I'm like, OK, from from this, why is that? I mean, what's the connection? But tweets, people don't really explain things they just put out there. But we should remember he was not the only civilian with a gun. Koishan, um, all local and foreigner, um, with licensed guns and where they should be looked at, uh, Siawato. Um, I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't just suspect everyone or look at everyone why. Um, my only question is who allows civilians to carry such heavy weapons? Who says what a heavy weapon is? So you do have some people, these Christ's daughter here would probably be heavily on the gun control side if they're in the United States of America. We need gun control. What kind of gun control? I don't know. We just need more gun control. Okay, um, they're gov these are government mercenaries. Eh, meh. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Cutting through here. Let's get back to that. So this is the different people talking about different things. Um, possibility thinking about wives and kids they left at home before taking the risk. Please don't ask some questions. Uh, so, yeah, these are just different things. Wondering, like, okay, what gets somebody to actually get in there? Now, not even the fact that you just have a weapon. I think if I'm going to live in somewhere, in a location, for me personally, I think I would like to be armed if you're going to be out in public. These things happen, and just having a weapon might help. And then they're saying in some of these situations, oh, civilians can actually end up causing more damage by shooting at people they can shoot civilians there's all this discussion how many people actually were shot by the the criminals and the civilians in the west gate situation in these kind of situations they say okay well, that crossfire but i think when somebody else has a gun already you having one is going to help some kind of prevention now there's figures and things like that where people don't really go to places where they might be armed people of course these people are going to target places that are soft targets it just makes sense but yeah, so it's hard to get a gun here, and that was the situation. So another question, yeah, here um, I was being asked um, some other questions that came up. Somebody sent me this photo and was asking, okay, what's with these guys? Why are they dressed like this? And yeah, they've gone through some training, but this whole idea of seeing the American guys like fully SWAT and all the things like that, that's a very limited thing, and not everyone in the world has that fully trained things. We do have different squads here that are fully trained, but most people, they walk around these AKs like this. These are plain clothes, policemen. You can see they were called, all the policemen in the area were called. They said, okay, there's a big situation. Please come in. If you're off duty, if you're doing something else, get to your barracks, get to your home, get your weapon, come in and see if you can help. So these people walk in. They do have a special squad of people who are actually fully armed, who have the, um, the bulletproof vests and things like that. And they were also there, but they were calling in anyone who could come and help. Here is an image of one of the terrorists. Now, Another thing, um, I was sending this, talking to people, and someone was like, oh, I was told by somebody, all our crazy people, someone in the United States of America, like, all our crazy people with guns are white, and so strange seeing a black person. I was like, okay, this is an oddly racial thing to say, but then United States of America is 63.7 or 60, 65% uh, white, like Caucasian, recent European descent, or whatever you want to kind of classify that as. So there's going to be a higher chance there's going to be shooters that are actually white. But when it comes to terrorists, um, I think we know the figures on that one. I don't really have to belabor the, the fact on that. Just look online and see the kind, the kind of people that are often terrorists. But then when you're talking about mass shooters, um, they don't really cover gang violence as much in the same way that they're going to cover an actual terrorist attack in the United States of America or a massive attack like that. This person, from where they live, I don't necessarily think they're getting a lot of news about Chicago and how many regular shootings there are there and how many shootings are shot by black people. But... If you hear, nobody in Kenya is saying this is a black shooter. People will look online and say, okay, this guy's of Somali origin. They all talk about the Muslim, the possible Muslim connection, the whole Al-Shabaab thing. But thinking 
black is not really something that's thought here. I'm sure some people are thinking these are black people and they think, oh, we have this black identity. But here in Nairobi, Kenya, it's more, as I mentioned, with the tribal things, uh, the, the different tribes like Luya tribe, Luo tribe, Kikuyu tribe. Then you have the different people, the Eritreans, the Somalis, the people like that now. So that these people are classified in that sense. I don't think they just think, oh, it's black people. But also, if you want to classify black, sub-Saharan, Negro, whatever you want to call it, it's about 95% that. So, of course, most of the shooters are going to be in that situation. But the terror attacks here have been predominantly people coming in from the northern border around Somalia. And it's it's a tough situation. It's a horrible situation, but that's just the way it is. And you do see occasional tweets like, okay, don't just set these things out. Certain communities are going to be profiled. But that's not really that big of a concern, at least from what I've seen, as it is where you have a loud contingent of people in the United States of America and things that happen in European countries and um, about don't profile these group of people. And here is, um, this was a day after you can see the trends. Uh, we shall overcome Kenya Unbound, Kenya Attack. And here goes with Ghostbusters. I think it's like a secret Ghostbusters movie. But anyway, so these are some of the uh, Twitter tags you can kind of check out and see if you want to actually know. And you must at least, you can follow me on there. I don't really post as much. But yeah, maybe we'll start posting more. But those are some of the trends. Some of the tags, if you guys want to see the hashtags, you guys want to see. And how many people actually think of that as a number anymore? It's like, now it's like hashtag, but it used to be like a number symbol when I was younger. Uh, anyway, so um, anyway, <laughs> so back to this. So you can check out, you can find more information about these things. Kenyan flag again. Now let's just jump into um, the last thing here, talking about some of, just showing you guys some of what's going on with, um, what's it called? We're going to go into some of the news articles of the things that are going on here in Kenya. Um, so you guys can kind of see what's being covered by, by local people, what's being the aftermath of this. And these are also some links and locations. If you guys want to get more information about what's going on, uh, feel free to check these out. Um, Daily Standard, this is one of the main uh, newspapers here, the Daily Standard, I mean, the Standard newspaper and the Daily Nation. Those are two major newspapers, and then I'm going to go to Citizen. Uh, let's just jump to the Citizen thing here right now, so we can show you guys what they were talking about. I was talking about that guy who actually got out, uh, Robert Ngeno, Ron Geno, sorry. Ron Geno, he was actually rescued eventually, so this guy was one of the first people that actually went out there. He said, Dear all, thank you for your support. I am now home with my family, and thanks to the brave, the brave uh, National Police uh, Service um, official of Kenya and the KDF, uh, Kenya Defense Force, for risking their lives to save others. So yeah, they got out and um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough situation that happened with this. So he was one of the first people to paint a picture of what was happening at Ducet Hotel Complex at the time. And it was just a rumor about exactly what was happening. Yeah, that's when I, I kind of saw this thing. So yeah, it's, it's a good thing that he got out. This is one positive story about this. And I was thinking, what would you guys think about a channel on network where it's like called the good news where we find people like Robert, where let's say I was covering this story, Ron, sorry, I keep saying Robert. Um, Ron Geno here. So instead of covering the negative stuff that happened, I would open up and say maybe a paragraph, this happened, this many people died, and then focus more on Ron's story. And just have an entire website where it's just positive news, good news about things that happened. So some stories would just be entirely good, but if something bad happens, if like a natural disaster happens, you focus on not the destruction that happened, maybe a story of somebody who saved somebody. Just focus on that. Would you guys go to a website like that? Is there something like that already? I thought that would be kind of an idea where I'd probably go to just boost up sometimes occasionally. Here's some other kind of things. People commenting. See a bomb there. Uh, see, that's a prime minister. Um, he's out there visiting some people. Not the prime minister, sorry, the vice president. He's out there visiting some of the uh, victims of the attack. Um, right here is the Daily Nation. You can see Al Shabaab's riverside attack and likely grand plan. So they're finding out more information. I guess there's intelligence to find out um, what's happening, why they did this, what this all kind of situation is happening. Uh, you can see here the Somali based militant group Al Shabaab claimed responsibility for the attack at the Dusit office, office and hotel complex on 14 Riverside Drive. Um, in Nairobi Westland suburb on Tuesday. Most immediately, it seemed it was time to coincide with the attack on the Kenyan contingent of the African Union peacekeeping force in Somali, Amison, exactly three years ago in 2016. That attack in which Al-Shabaab claimed to have captured 12 Kenyan Defense Forces troops with at least 63 killed was the deadliest up to that point uh, on Amison. 
So Amazon is kind of like a NATO type forcing, but here in Kenya, so in, in Africa, so there's different coalition of different countries that just give contingents a couple of, um, what's, the, what's the actual, um, um, I can't think of the actual term, companies or something like that, a couple of groups that are like, okay, these, these people are going to be, we're to have these people under the Amazon kind of leadership and they're going to do these kind of peacekeeping and these different military type of um, operations. Um, but even if Shabab could claim their attack is as its biggest prize uh, against Amazon, it isn't sufficiently emotive to mark with another. Shabab has now been at this longer than most of its adversaries, and in recent years shown that it has a long game. Now, Al-Shabaab has been one of the more active ones. Uh, here in Africa, you're, people are more familiar with Al-Shabaab, but globally, people are more familiar with Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS and things like that. But Al-Shabaab has been terrorizing African countries for quite a long time. So you can definitely check out, um, I'll leave links below, you guys can check this out. And the standard, this is um, this front page of um, another newspaper, and you can see these different stories are kind of being gone. And this is the gory images, so uh, NYT, um, is it NYT24? I think that's like a local network or something. Uh, we can check that out, but you can see these different articles kind of being, this is the front page of that uh, website. Um, you can see the different things. So they're talking about this thing. And this is what I was talking about. There were some really gory images online. It was like, wow, I can't believe this stuff is still up. But hey, that's the way the world is. And even with other terror attacks, right after you can still find some really gruesome imagery. Um, and yeah, so they're saying the New York Times uh, Bureau Chief, yeah, I guess it's the New York Times not doing it. So you can see the New York Times is uh, the failing New York Times is also messing things up here. But yeah, so the way things work here, um, someone was talking about uh, the international people are not really covering this. When friends were checking in on me and talking to me, I was like, oh, we're not covering it yet. I'm like, oh, it's not they don't want to cover it. First of all, how many people are actually getting the information? It takes some time. What they do is they normally have maybe like um, New York Times may have one person here. The BBC may have two people, two reporters in the region. Kenya is kind of central to um, to uh, eastern Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa area. So people kind of post it out here. There's a lot of international organizations. So they may have two reporters on staff, each with their own crew, maybe a camera guy, then one producer kind of handling the whole thing. But no, what they normally do is source from local reporters, source from local individuals, go online, find things. Someone posts a video online, they get in touch with that person, they call them, they confirm, are you this? We have to get a release form. Can we use this internationally? Because we're going to be making money from this. We don't want to be liable. So it takes some time for these things to expand. But now if you check online, there's a lot of international people actually covering this. You can check the different stories and things like that. But um, I think that's it for this video. That's kind of my overview for this. Um, <sighs> Yeah, it's it's a messed up situation. A lot of things are coming out of this. I, I don't really know what, what more to say about this, but um, for me, it's just... <laughs> I think the world is going to change when people kind of realize how connected we are. This whole... I know there's a fight between this 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 anti-globalization kind of movement in the United States of America, more on the political right, which my political leanings seem to be close to the conservative type thing, but I'm more like libertarian, anarcho-capitalist type of thing, where I'm like, look, and my whole lifestyle, my whole life, lived experience has been international, moving to Europe, to Africa, to the United States of America, and seeing people in different places, knowing people like, oh, something happens in Taiwan, oh, I know someone in Taiwan, and it, it, it brings that thing closer, and that whole lived experience thing, I think it does have some aspect. And I was thinking, what is, what's it going to be in a few generations from now, even just this generation coming up, where most of the people who are making big decisions in the world don't think of the world as just their town or their city or their nation, but think of this global idea where they have a close friend that they grew up with, talked to, maybe played online with, like, through playing some video game and they were online, or you've been following this manga, this kind of comic book online, and then you're in the chat rooms and you're talking about these things and you know somebody from this other country, and then eventually you become a world leader and you're making these big decisions, and then it comes to the point where you have to do something with the country that this person is from. You're not going to treat that country in the same way as these opposition, these aliens, these random people, you're going to have some kind of connection where it's like, this is where this person who meant something to me is from. We're going to get the sense more where we're actually earthlings and we're not just these people living in these different enclaves where we actually don't really relate to people. I had people get in touch with me from Sweden. I had people get in touch with me from Asia. I had people in different places in the United States of America. Some people I hadn't talked to in a while here in Kenya, I was reaching out to them. And it's just... It sucks that some of these bad things have to happen for people to get together, but if that's what it takes, I think the positive aspect of it is going to come out that people eventually are going to get together over these things. So, 
that's it for this video. Um, like, share, and subscribe. I'll have some more videos coming up soon. But as I said, it's going to be links below to these three websites that I had up here. There's a lot of more information you guys can find out on your own. If you have any more questions about this actual topic, let me know in the comment section. I may refer to some of them if I can get any information, or I may just post some more other things or have a follow-up video if I can think of anything worth saying on these things. But yeah, uh, like, share, and subscribe. Till next video, goodbye. So on the screen right now is some merchandise, merchandise store links below to that. You can check this out and much more. The Soul 3 on this is by Tom Soul. Three questions that he asks people, normally in an economic sense. He's an economist, thinker, philosopher, all-around great human being. But if we were to apply this to this whole idea of mine of, okay, wait 48, 24 to 48 hours before talking about this. So compared to what? Yeah, I could just bust out and live tweet something or live stream something immediately. And in some situations, I might do that. But this one, I think it's good to kind of have something to compare this to. Be like, okay, what can I actually compare this situation to? Compared to me just telling you these things immediately. And I have to come back and be like, oh, no, no, this information has come out. Oh, no, this information has come out. I can wait 24 to 48 hours. And I think by that time, you have some kind of information. I've collected enough to actually give some decent perspective to you guys about it and there's a lot of other things you guys can get for the live kind of instant information online already so at what cost what cost do i have to just jump on these things i think you jump on these things and get flagged down by talking about certain things it can be wrong information get people upset or excited about things that should be upset or excited about in my opinion you wait for some time and things come in in a better way um what solid proof do you have? That's another question that I like asking. Whenever these things happen, like what solid proof does somebody have about the thing that has actually been said or occurring? I don't know what's going on. I don't know the figures. I don't know who's there. I don't know who's not. And I think 48 hours is a good time to actually wait and hear some of these things. So let me know about this 48 hour thing. Uh, you guys interested in this? Will more people check this out? Do you think more people could do this? Is there other people just waiting and saying, okay, I'm gonna take some time? Or do you think I should give you guys maybe on Twitter or some other platform some immediate kind of thoughts and then later on put a video out like this? Let me know. Like, share, and subscribe. Hit me up in the comment section. Goodbye.